Yeah. yeah. And it's live stream. So it's not that great. Do you want to move the camera to a place that more straight on? I, I try finding some double sided tape, but other things with priorities. Destruction. If I feel out here, I never know. Okay. Well, okay. I'm gonna start. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Where do you want me to sit? Wherever you want. <laughs> That's me. Yeah, that is you. All right, I'm gonna get started. So I'm pleased to introduce Britt Pendleton, who's my graduate student. So this is the last proposal talk for graduate students, but now we're shifting to a new and I don't know better, hopefully improved version 2.0 of uh, how graduate students propose and share their um, their research with uh, our community. And so Britt is the last one. She's also the last talk of the semester. Um, so this is pretty exciting. And I thought I'd share just a little bit about Britt. Um, so most of you probably know Britt and Sam. You've probably seen them through yeah. Sam. <laughs> um, so a little bit of background for Britt. Britt was actually in the military for five years. So she was at the Air and National Guard. Um, she then pursued biology careers at the Oregon Institute of Technology, and then she came to get her bachelor's degree at Boise State. Um, so I met Brett when she was in my comparative physiology class, um, and then she worked in the lab as a variety of different technicians, physicians in the lab, working with a variety of different students, just sort of eager and hungry to work on everything all the time. Um, so she helped a lot of my students with a lot of their work. Um, and she just kept at it, which was great. I did. She did. Um, so Britt told a story the other day that I thought was interesting. She said that the scientists used to come into her class, I don't even know what, how old you were at the time when Britt grew it. But she, they would say, hey, you should all be scientists and come do research and go to graduate school or go to undergraduate. And she, she sort of looked up and said, you guys aren't talking to me. And now here she is, that they were talking to her. So she was one of these people that didn't think that she wanted to go to science or didn't know she could. And now she's here and she's uh, kicking, it, kicking the crap out of it. So Britt is not only a really great scientist and doing great things, she's our social coordinator for the lab. So she tends to be the person that says, hey, you guys, let's get together, let's do something. One of those things will be hopefully getting a beer after this is over. And so you're all welcome. Site, location to be determined. Yeah, all right, we'll say it at the end. Um, so she coordinates all the, all the activities in the lab. She's also, in all her free time, uh, is an excellent uh, baker. I guess so. Cake she's decorator. creative. She's a cake decorator. So this is from Zoe. She's done this for all the students so far. So these are, um, this is the sagebrush step, and these are, um, no, the, that's the gut. <laughs> these are the guts, and it's just fecal pellets, and this is a fence, <laughs> a fence with high cover and low cover. So she's very creative with her treats as well, with her timing. So she's, she's excellent um, in making creative uh, treats for all of us. Um, she's also been doing a lot of our technology, so me not so much, Britt very much. So she's helped coordinate along with others aside of a watch program, and this is how she helps me post things. So she actually wrote a document step by step of blog posts for dummies, which is me, and I was actually able to post things internationally because of this wonderful <laughs> blog posting for dummies. So Britt is helping me become more technologically savvy and share our stuff with the world. Um, she also, so while I was off on sabbatical in Scandinavia, I said, yeah, sure, I'll coordinate and help host and mentor a couple of students. And I said, Britt, what do you think? Do you want to just do this? So she took this over and she worked with a variety of Julie Heath's lab with uh, three, two undergraduates and then with Ben, who's a graduate student. And she helped coordinate and do a lot of the chemistry and get these students organized. And I did nothing. And then they did really great. And then people said, Jen, you're great. And I said, no, it's good. So she's really good, excellent at that, too. And then she brings diverse people together. So she's working on a project in collaboration with Julie Heath um, uh, at these Golden Eagles, which she's going to talk to you about. She's also um, working with Bill Borland, who, Dr. Bill Borland, who um, on the scanning electron microscopy, so doing some new technologies, which is really great. And then she's brought into the um, into our world Emma Weeks, who is from the University of Florida, who does pesticide development, and so has worked on the organism she's going to talk about. So she brings really diverse people to us. Um, and I think, like, Britt is the, you know, when you look at what NSF wants in terms of diversity, right, Britt is the example of what diversity should be. 
Um, she's incredible. She um, brings people together. She has great ideas. And so I think she is the reason why we need to both recruit and retain, retain underrepresented groups. And so I'm so pleased to have Brooke because she's kicking the crap out of what she does. And I'm excited to have her tell you about it. And so I will say no more and I'll have Britt come up and tell you about what she plans to do over the next few years. Thank you guys. So um, before I get into my talk, I, I brought some goodies um, that I'll, I'm going to pass around the room. So these are my sp study species. Um, so um, here are my Mexican chicken buds and these are my common bed bugs. I didn't bring any live ones, I'm sorry. So um, <laughs> you'll notice a few things in these guys when you're passing them around. Um, one is that the common bed bug is uh, much bigger than the Mexican chicken bug. Uh, these guys are both uh, belong to the family uh, Simicidae, so you'll hear me refer to them as Simicids. Um, they are a true parasite, in fact that they, they require blood to grow, and, but they don't actually live on their hosts. Um, the guys in the jars that are brown, those are your adults, and the kind of like um, translucent ones, those are those are your, your baby bugs. And when they eat, they get filled with like, they look like little red balls, but it's, it's adorable. <laughs> I know that most people won't agree with me, but it, it, it's true. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about how I'm going to use these guys to maybe potentially find new sources of pesticide control or pest control. So um, in today's world, we face a lot of uh, pests that create these destructive type things, anywhere from disease to crop destruction, we get deforestation happening. Um, and these guys pack, pack a big punch. And we're constantly trying to figure out ways to kind of um, control them. And there's kind of two ways to do that. Well, let me let me say it. there's more than two ways to do that. But we'll start with with two broader categories, which are um, intervention measures and prevention measure, measures. And intervention measures are um, when you don't think about the problem before it happens, such as a sunburn. And so now you have to treat that sunburn with like aloe vera. And then preventative is like, oh, you actually had some rain, so you thought about the problem before it happened, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna throw, slap on some some sunscreen, no sunburn. So when I use those terms, those are the types of things I want you guys thinking about. So then you can break it down into four other ooh, this clicker is going to um, categories of cultural practices, uh, physical measures, uh, biological measures, and then chemical measures. Um, and so as the colors get darker, they become less preventative and more toxic. And so of course a chemical chemicals will be up there at the top. Um, we as humans have a tendency to rely on these pesticides because they're very highly effective, they're easy to get our hands on, um, and they're, they're pretty cheap. So here on our, God, your guys' is left. <laughs> I do not know my left, my right. Um, you, this is a picture taken from the 1930s on a local beach. Uh, they're using a fogger to just spray DDT. To, to handle the mosquitoes. So um, US now has, has uh, measures that, that protect against this and restrict, restrict this kind of use. But over here on our right, um, this is early 2010s in India. So in these less developed countries, they rely on um, the effectiveness and, and the cheapness of these products. So they tend to still use these types of practices today. So overuse of this, these pesticides have, have led to a specific type of resistance known as knockdown resistance. And this is to um, a class of chemicals known as pyrethroids. And so that's what they're actually using in those fog foggers is uh, like DDT and pyrethroids. And so this is, was found in like the early 1990s and is now current all the way up to 2015. And it's found in, being found in more and more uh, insect species. So on top of our current and past bad practices, there's a few things that insects also have that um, make them very susceptible to this, resi this resistance. Um, one of those things is that they have a quick response time. So uh, 
they have rapid generation, so you have multiple generations in a year, and then you can also have these really large brood sizes. And then uh, <laughs> parasites also experience an even more increased uh, pressure because they get super exposed to these things because they're just a nuisance. You know, they're like, are you gonna go to preventative measures for like mosquitoes? No, you're gonna go straight to that chemical stuff because not with those guys biting you. So that creates like a, a super. So you get these parasites. And so this kind of back and forth between um, parasites and their hosts um, creates almost like a, a battle like scenario. And um, so what we'll have is a parasite parasitizing its host, the host experiencing reduced fitness because of that. And then they go out and they exploit chemicals. So we do that with, with our pesticides. But then our pest then becomes resistant to those chemicals. And now we have to find new ways to deal with that. So we've just finished our first round of this with pests and or insect pests. And so now we're stuck in this final last position of now trying to find new ways to exploit these chemicals. So how do we do that? Well, currently, oh, sorry about the random, random notes over there. Don't worry, I'll make some. Um, so currently the big thing is, uh, is for researchers to go one to two ways. They synthesize compounds that they already know are effective. And then the second one is, is really random. It's just a shotgun approach. Let's just try all the chemicals and see what works. But like that can be like finding a needle in a haystack, right? So um, a new kind of up and coming way to do this is uh, to study the medicine of indigenous people. This is known as ethnomedicine. And interestingly enough, uh, some of the, their practices have been um, acquired by watching and observing animals and how they are de dealing with similar ailments in that environment. So my, my suggestion is that we just go straight to those animals and, and see how they're dealing with similar issues to what we are dealing with. So this is uh, known as um, zoo pharmacognosy, which is a real mouthful, so I'm not allowed to say it, <laughs> but, um, or self-medication, which is a little bit of a misnomer, but um, the idea behind it is is that um, why wouldn't you medicate yourself, right? If you have the chance to, you have to learn to cope with, with these problems. So right here on our left, we have an example of anting. So this is when uh, birds actually go out, find an anthill and like flop down on it and like let the insects crawl on them. And then, uh, or not insects, specifically ants. And then they bite at the ants, which releases formic acid. And this formic acid is thought to um, deter or even kill parasites. Um, this middle picture is we got some capuchin monkeys. Um, they were given some green onions, which then they all grouped up and took turns rubbing them all over each other. This is known as a uh, social anointing, and it is also thought to deter ectoparasites. And so our last picture here on the right is uh, a pair of blue tits that are in their nest box and they've included all this uh, greenery right here, um, which is typically aromatic and doesn't hold any structural function. And they think that they are including this stuff because it helps protect the nestlings against parasites and pathogens. So this is known as the nest protection hypothesis. So these are all examples of, of zoopharmacognosis or, or self-medication. And, but before they're able to be considered examples of self-medication, they kind of have to fulfill these three criteria. So one is that our kin or the individual have to benefit from um, the use of the plants. And then two is that they must be actively selecting for bioactive compounds. So, and then lastly, they have to, the pest actually has to be negatively affected in some way by the use of these plants. And so we actually think here in southern Idaho, we might have an example of this nest protection and hypothesis um, occurring because some of those criteria have been filled. Um, so here we have the blue tits. They, you can see the similarities in the greenery lining in the nest. And then um, lastly, you can see our simicid, our Mexican chicken bug, which are really tiny compared to the chicken or the common bed bug. And they're, they're, they're pretty nasty. Um, parasites that can cause anemia, um, dehydration, and 
I'm pretty sure that I've talked to a number of researchers that believe that um, some nestling deaths have occurred directly from um, being parasitized by these guys. So Ben has been um, doing some stuff uh, that's actually really cool. And so this is the graph that he used to kind of convince all of us that something cool was happening. That uh, with the presence of uh, the presence of simicids decreasing with the amount of green plant material uh, in the nest. So the more green plant material you had, the less uh, chicken bugs you had. Um, ben also shared some of his data with me about uh, nestling health, and it looks like there is a correlation, a positive correlation, that when the greenery is included, nestling health benefits. So look forward to that next semester. Um, so this is Logan, as Jen mentioned, and he looked at um, active selection. So what he did is he went out into these nesting territories of the golden eagles and looked at um, the proportion that was, that was put into the nest versus the proportion available in the habitat. So anything above this dotted line here, um, we can say is being actively selected for. Anything below, while still being selected for, is not really being selected. So our kind of our big ones are uh, gray rabbit brush, we consider being selected, and then um, base and base sagebrush not being uh, not being selected for. And then Emmanuel, uh, he actually took these plants and looked at the chemicals within uh, them. Two classifications. So he looked at the phenolics and the terpenes in the green nest material. And you'll see that uh, our gray rabbit brush had the highest amounts of phenolics present, and our base and big sage had um, the highest amount of terpenes available. So yes, they do have bioactive compounds. So we kind of have two, two of these criteria filled. We're, we're missing this last one, which is that our pests must be negatively affected. And my thesis aims to, uh, to, to sh answer this. Yeah, I wrote that. So I have three research questions that I'm kind of focusing on. So one is, do the bioactive compounds from the nest material deter Mexican chicken bugs from sheltering? Um, two, uh, do these compounds actually kill the chicken bugs? And then lastly, um, I'm going to look at some olfactory morphology of, of simicids. So I'm going to focus on this first question. So this, this question is really trying to get to whether or not these compounds are preventative, right? So if they will avoid sheltering because of, uh, of PS, or not PS, I'm sorry, bioactive compounds, then, then it will be an effective means to deter those, those bugs from setting up shop. So I believe that these subjects will avoid areas that are saturated with these bioactive I'm going to use uh, a couple of treatments to, to figure out what might be happening here. So I'm going to look at the not selected and the selected individual plants. But I'm also going to do a mixture created in the lab of the proportions found in the nest. Um, because it might be the idea that instead of picking for individual compounds, the eagles might be selecting for a, a more diverse um, set of chemicals that might be interacting and working together. To, to deter. And then I will use a uh, positive control of deltamethrin, uh, which is a known bed bug deterrent. And then I'm going to, uh, and then I'll use my solvents as, as my control. So this is how I'm going to do this. So first, I'm going to make my plant extractions, which look really pretty. Each one of those is a different species, so they each kind of come out with different colors. Um, I'm going to take those extractions and I'm going to saturate these little tents with them. Uh, the bugs like hanging out in these. Anywhere that's not light, that's where they want to be. Don't mind the dry blood. <laughs> so um, I will then place these tents in an arena and you will see uh, We'll get an olfaction gradient happening, and then the bug will be placed in after the olfaction gradient has been achieved. So 
while this is occurring, we will be recording it, and then um, we will process these videos using a behavioral logging system known as Porus. Um, and we're going to look for things like how much time is being spent in each region, and then also uh, things like intentional grooming, which we've noticed they tend to do in the presence of bioactive compounds. They do not like it on their animals. So this is the kind of data that we're expecting to see. I expect that our positive control in our next nest mixture are going to outperform our individual plants. Um, gray rabbit brush might outperform uh, base and big sagebrush. We're not sure, but the reasoning behind this would be because the uh, gray rabbit brush is actually being selected for. So that might have, have something going on there. So my second question focuses more on um, is this a intervening measure? So if I get an infestation, can I use these compounds to actually get rid of the bugs if I already have them? And I believe that um, in the concentrations found in the nest, we will see an increased um, mortality in our, in our bugs. I'll use the same treatments as I described before, and I will do it kind of the same way, but not really. So once again, we'll do plant extractions, but um, instead, they'll just be placed in a, they'll saturate the filter paper and be placed in a petri dish. The bug will then be isolated in there with some, some tape so it can't escape. Um, and then they'll be observed for a period of 14 days. So periodically throughout this uh, 14 days, we will come in and we're going to literally like poke the bug just to see what will happen. Um, this is real science. No. <laughs> so, um, when we book bug, we're going to use this behavioral response index to kind of assess what kind of liveliness they're, they're in. So, um, we've got everywhere from dead, where they're just feet up in the air, not moving, to healthy, where they're quick and they're like, don't touch me. So, um, and so this is the type of data we plan to see for that. So we're going to get similar results with our um, average behavioral response index, where we see our positive control in our nest mixture outperforming our individual plants. But we're also going to be able to, at uh, the end of the time course, so at the end of 14 days. And we chose 14 days because 14 days, after 14 days, you can't tell whether the bugs actually died from the compounds or if they just starved. So that's why we did 14 days. Um, but we'll be able to pull out these survival curves um, where we should be seeing death in our, for sure, in our um, positive control, and then um, I believe in our positive air in our nest mixture as well. And so, yes, this will tell us whether or not we can use these things actually, these compounds to actually kill our bugs. Wrong way. So, we've got these two kind of questions. Um, potentially being answered. But how are the pests identifying these compounds in their surroundings? Um, and that's what this question is going to kind of answer. So um, do some acids share olfactory morphology? Let me tell you, and I think they will, but let me tell you about olfaction morphology. So here we have a bunch of different antennas. So antenna are the major or major sensory organ in insects. So you get a lot of variation and they're kind of shaped by their environment and what they're experiencing because the things are sensing in their environment. So on each of these you kind of have um, all these bristles. So this is uh, a bed bug picture or drawing and their olfaction region happens up here at the top. So O1 and O2. So those are olfaction regions one and two. But if you were to go zoom in You'd see this little group peg. Underneath that, you get these little bundle of neurons happening. And these neurons are what are um, sending the signals to the brain of what they're actually picking up. So these things are not random, though. So the sensilla actually happen at certain spots on the antenna. Um, there are three major sensilla that are, have been correlated with olfaction. That's our C, D, and E olfaction. C, D, C, D, and E sensilla. So our C sensilla is known as a grooved peg sensilla, and so it's this very bottom one. And then our D sensilla is this middle one that's kind of in between, 
And then our hair-like bristle up there is our e-sensilla. And recently, research has shown that um, d-sensilla specifically uh, are responding to volatiles. So all, not all, all the compounds that you see in plants are volatile compounds. So um, here we have a graph of, um, I know this has no axes, it's like the worst thing ever, but um, here, keep them thinking. <coughs> so right here, there's no stimulus being uh, applied to that sensilla of the, the bed bugs <coughs> antenna. Right here, odorant was applied. So the odorant here was camphor and here's cineol. And each one, as the spikes get bigger, that means that the neurons are firing off higher, more intensely, and as they're closer together, it's more frequent. So cineol and camphor, we actually see in sagebrush. We know that they occur here. And so, um, <coughs> yeah. So we know that bed bugs, specifically bed bugs, already have the capabilities of detecting these things. So we should be able to correlate that with, or not correlate, but um, show that that our Mexican chicken bugs should have similar um, responses because there shouldn't be that much divergence between these two species. So I'm going to do this with the help of Dr. Bill Borland. Um, I don't think many of you guys know this, but we actually have a scanning electron microscope in the biology building. It's on the second floor. Um, it's not getting used much, so for, like you guys should get out there, like use this thing. It's really <laughs> awesome, and learning how to use an SEM is actually not that difficult. I could probably teach you, which says a lot. <laughs> so the kind of way you do this is uh, you take your specimen, you dry it, so you want to extract all the moisture from it, and then you place it in a sputterer, which is like the coolest thing ever. Um, you put your specimen on there, and it just shoots gold ions at it. And so you get like a gold-coated bug at the end. It's really cool. But this is what kind of protects what you're looking at from being destroyed by, by the blood talking. And so down here, this is your electron microscope. And it does. It makes very, very pretty pictures. So um, this is one I took of a Mexican chicken bug uh, spring of this year. So this is the type of data we expect to see. So our orange are like our predicted. Um, this has already been done on the common bed bug, so these are actual numbers. So I think they should be about the same. Um, and I, we do plan on looking at domestic chicken bugs to see if there's any difference between them and the Mexican chicken bug. They should be the same species, but there might, there might be something different happening there. But we plan to look into that and see what's happening. So with all this information, we should be able to come back and, and reflect and see, okay, we are not the only people that experience, or not the only organisms that experience these, these problems in our world. And that we should be looking to other places that are also dealing with these things and seeing how they're dealing with it so that we can harness that and use it to our benefit and also maybe to their benefit as well. And with that, I'll take any questions. Do you know what the average lifespan of these bugs is? And also, do you plan on looking at how different polygonal stages of the bug can be impacted by compounds? Is this going to fit us? So, the, I'm just going to look at adults. So, like, unlike like butterflies and stuff, like they're, Dr. Upstein can't remember the word for what the morph is, but I think it's hemi. I mean, yeah, sure, okay. <laughs> but they're they're similar throughout each instar, so they should be reacting to these things the same way. But um, to answer lifespan, oh god, so these guys they're very hardy except for when I'm trying to keep them alive. <laughs> um, they can live, I would say, probably for a year or two, um, and they do this thing like they don't have to very often. Um, I actually had a uh, chicken bug that I accidentally, um, he was in a jar, like he was contained, but he was up under the hood for two weeks and I didn't know and I went up there and he was still there. And mind you, 
the hood's really dry. And so I have no idea how to survive. He was with me with, for one day before he died. So I'm saying, just let me loose in all the, the hotel, seedy hotels. I'll try and keep the beds alive. They'll surely, they'll surely, surely die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what kind of bug is this scabie? My best friend got those. Wow. My husband got them immediately, and it looked so gross under a microscope. It yeah. Was like scary looking. Pretty sure sca scabies are lice. Late lice. Lice. <laughs> yeah, louse is the plural, right? Yeah. They seem to last forever. Oh, yeah. Parasites are really good at lasting forever. They can be super hard. Yeah, go ahead. What's the next step uh, in your research if you find some success? Oh God, I've not thought that far ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to do this, man. <laughs> yes, so there's some other things happening in the system that I'd be really interested in seeing. Um, one is, and I don't know, have any idea how to test this, but um, if there is selection going on for these compounds, are are eagles assessing mate quality based on this? Like, would they prefer a male that brings more greenery to the nest than, than a male that doesn't? I think that'd be a really interesting question to look at next. But we gotta show that it's actually happening first. Yeah. So that that brings up an interesting question. There are a couple of alternative hypotheses. Mm -hmm. yes, and I, I think um, one of the things as you go through the Try and think about ways to to support your hypotheses and undermine those, or look for evidence. That would, that <laughs> no, that's that great. That so way. I don't plan on undermining because I am very much a believer that I think that these are non mutually exclusive mm -hmm. hypotheses. So yeah, it's the courtship one, and then you have the dry drug hypothesis, and then the nest protection. But I I feel like they're very very interconnected. So there's there's another one that was published. Years ago, yeah, by a guy, I think it's Fabrizio Sergio, who designs for nature. Okay, where he had black kites that would decorate the nests with all kinds of garbage. Yeah, and it, it wasn't just courtship, it was signaling to other yeah. birds. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, so it's the signaling thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that's yeah. yeah, for sure. The other, the other thing that I was going to ask you is um, you showed that sagebrush had some of these turns. Select against it. Yeah, so well, so they're still selecting it. Like, if they weren't selecting it, it just wouldn't make its way in the nest at all. So they are bringing it to the nest, just not in the proportions that we would expect. Um, I so something interesting that's kind of so you saw the difference between the phenolics and the terpenes. So phenolics are different in that they're less volatile than terpenes, so they might might last longer in the nest. So. They might be choosing sagebrush, but not as heavily for that reason. But that's just speculation at this point. Oh gosh. Um, Amy, go ahead. Um, so that kind of brings me to a question of, can you explain a little bit more why you think a mixture of lots of different plant types might be better than just one plant type? And then how are you, like, are you going to be able to test different proportions of different things, or are you just going to test one proportion? I'm just going to test the one proportion. So um, I'm going to try and take my cue from the eagles and say they know best. Um, when it comes to like mixtures, Jen and I talk about this a lot, and we'll see if I can remember anything. But um, this, these mixtures are, so it's like, this is where my vampire story would came in great. So, um, when you're thinking about this, you want to like, you want to diversify. Like, there's diverse. You see that like with sexual selection and asexual selection, like diversity is always best. So like, it might not just be if they're brushed by one type of chemical, they might be able to create that resistance to it quicker than if they had a bunch of different ones coming back and trying to fight multiple pathways would be more difficult than just trying to fight it on one front. I guess I don't know. Did that answer? That's great. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I still answered that one. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm curious, like, um, would, could you have a, a bird selecting these foods or have that representation of the picture of the brand and that's actually underrepresent like how it would be and still be selecting for it? Like, there's some personal response in the nest and maybe uh, this sort of negative comment. 
this it's just enough. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I think that's what you're asking is kind of like the idea of like dosage, right? Yeah. So, yes. So, at like high concentrations, the, these these compounds can have like negative effects on them. So, um, yeah, and I don't know how they do it, but they're actually really good at sensing what is enough and hitting within that therapeutic window. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. The nest wings might experience. So the thing that I would say is probably in terms of like volatiles, they're not going to experience too many negative effects. But like if they're doing like self medication through ingestion, you'd have to be much more careful about like the concentration of plants you're using. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was just thinking about the blood that showed they had like the different types of species, whether they were above or below. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering if they could be below the bar. That's so so yeah, if they're above that bar, they get they're selected for. So let me see if I can pull that out. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so should the basin take sagebrush actually be being selected for, but only as at a level that yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like that idea. I like that. That that might be that might be what's happening. That's a good question, for sure. So I'm kind of as curious about this evolution of resistance to more man-made pesticides, human pesticides. And it seems like they actually have a good system here to continue replicating bats. Presumably, you get lots of individuals at once with the genetic diversity in there. And I wonder if you can look at um, like the population level, the frequency of survivors versus you know, you know natural versus there, I might see that effect of the connections that are combined with that you know, resistance is harder to yeah. evolve. Right? Yeah, so um, that's kind of like the problem now is like the, the classifications of compounds that we use against pests now is like we're very, it's super narrow. There's actually not a whole lot of them out, so we're unable to really diversify like the type of compounds we're using, which I think is like a big downfall for us. So, yeah, it's like this idea of using mixtures might might be better, but yeah, I don't know, Jeanette, yeah, maybe, we'll see. <laughs> oh, hold on, Dr. Lee. I've actually, don't run answer this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, this is a good question, because it's like, they um, use that same olfactory region on their antenna. The hexanol, I can't remember if it's like one, four, I don't think it matters, but hexanol and octanol are um, stuff that comes out in our sweat that they pick up and they bind to. So that's one of the things that they use. That's more closer proximity type things though. Like uh, further to proximity, you see things like heat attracting them and then um, carbon dioxide is the other one. So they, they, it's kind of funny, if you go in and you breathe in their jar, it like, wakes them up. There's, oh gosh, there's something around. That and heat too. So like they get immediately busy when those cues are available to them. And then the addition of like um, the sweat smells and stuff, um, let them know for certain that they're, they're biting into the right thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, this is an interesting question in terms of like host specificity is I know for a fact that the chicken bugs will eat human blood but I also know that they'll eat cow blood so I don't know if it's more of like what's available to them I think to them in their mind that they'll still pick up those same cues and that they'll eat it if they're desperate Oh, in terms of blood? Yeah. Um, bed bugs, they have. Um, chicken bugs, not so much. Like, seriously, nobody studied the chicken bugs since like the 1940s. That guy's probably dead. It makes me sad. He's probably the only person that could relate to me in this world. But um, in chicken bugs, 
they are not chicken bugs, but in bed bugs, they uh, <clears throat> there's a couple of different things they've looked at in terms of like what they like in blood. Um, they don't like it when it has like chemical um, de de oh gosh anticoagulant. There we go. So like any kind of chemical um, anticoagulant, they don't like. But like you can, they have physical uh, defibrination of blood. They like that. Um, they prefer mammals, prefer larger animal, mammals, so like bovine and horse, and they've seen success with lamb or sheep. And then they've also done rabbit. It seems that rabbit's actually not a blood they're too fond of. I don't know what's driving those things, though, at all. Yes, ma'am. So you said these guys aren't living on their host, so they're not on the bird, so they live in the nest then. Yeah. So well, they, that's my what do they do over winter? Like, are they alive in that nest? Or? Um, actually, this is a question that I would really like to answer. <laughs> um, so they see them come up then around May is when they start showing up, or uh, March. March is when they start waking up. But yeah, they overwinter. We we suspect they overwinter in the nest. Like, there's other vertebrates that visit the nest, so they don't just feed on the nestlings. So probably during the summer months after the nestlings have left, they're probably feeding um, the blood of, yeah, like rock pigeons that visit or, or uh, mice that are up there. Um, but yeah, they go into, to, I would, I suspect they go into the house over winter, and then they sleep, and then when it starts getting warmer, they come back out. They're not active. Uh, going back to Julie's question with how do they know what to like, yeah. what to eat. Uh, you said that they're attracted to heat, and then when they get close to the heat source they're attracted to, their antenna tell them whether or not it's something they want to take a bite out of, right? So look, thinking back to your experimental design, maybe another avenue to think of with terms of signal and camphor, both of which are volatile aromatic compounds. So Maybe they're not repelling the bugs or killing the bugs. Maybe they're just confusing them well, because that, they can't yes. get that particular biological cue that no. this thing is good to eat. So I agree with you. That that's considered a repelling technique. So that falls under repellency. But that, I do believe that that's what's happening. I think that these chemicals are probably causing confusion to where they can't figure out. Their head from the butt. Yeah. Maybe in your <laughs> tent design, there's a way you can add a variable to your tent design. You come to me with ideas, Dan, and I'll, I'll listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. So, since you do have, sorry, I was just, uh, yeah, no. So, no, um, so these bugs kind of have two modes. They have, I want to eat and I want to hide. So for me, it was, they done the test trying to get them to go past barriers um, with that. It's just really hard to get them to go in the direction that you want them to. Um, that and usually the eating mechanism is easily, like, if they're desperate enough, they'll, they'll do anything. In some of the papers I've read, they, deltamethrin, which is a known repellent and a killer of bed bugs, they would sit in that just so they could eat. Just sit. Even though it's like killing them, like I think 15 minutes is the, the exposure time to kill them. They would just, yeah, they don't, they don't care. So I felt that Harbridge, as long as they're well fed, they always want to hide. So I felt that that would be an easier way to to show repellency. And plus, they're more in that mode. They spend more time in that um, <coughs> needing to find shelter mode than they do in that feeding mode. So, Alex, with your four tanks per dish. Yeah. What's to keep the localized air of the dish kind of saturated with all four chemicals at the same time? 
So we are at, oh, so it's not, it's all, okay. Or, or am I wrong, or they're not for different? They're, they're not for different. Yeah, and I, I failed to explain that, and that's my fault. So um, one of these will just not be treated with anything, and these three will be treated with the same extracts, is the plan. Um, so I did this design based on a paper that Dr. Robertson had um, exposed me to in uh, insect ecology, where they were looking at bees and nest um, sites. And um, because this is used just a simple t-test to do this, so this is almost a more robust form of that. And so you're giving them more wrong choices than right choices. And it was kind of the theory. So the idea they were just all four each other. Yeah, and so, yeah. yeah. Shelter area where at least the localized yeah. effluent is yeah. less. And I'm up against a problem right now where this is actually, they are being overwhelmed in this small arena. So the arena is actually going to become bigger so that there's more room for those volumes to kind of settle. And so they're not being overwhelmed. And I can better assess the repellency of them. Is there, a, I'm sorry, is, is there a distance from which they're going to be able to, can you just lower the concentrations that you're using instead of increasing the distance that they're going to um, So three centimeters is their olfactory kind of distance from what I've read. So this here is one centimeter. So we're not, I'm not making the world's largest bed bug Super Bowl or anything. <laughs> so, yeah, so. I could lower the dosages, but like the, the concentrations are so important here. So I don't want to mess with those too much. So what I'm going to do is, for my concentrations, I plan on taking um, the concentrations of the delta methrin and trying to um, get my other plant chemicals at those same concentrations. And then I'm also going to have the nest mixture concentrations as well. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of going back to like the. Uh, can I answer this? What they choose to have in the nest. Mm -hmm. Have the birds always used the same concentration of different plants that they use, or has it changed over the years the same as the bed bugs have changed? Does that make sense? Yes, it does okay. make sense, but I don't have the answer to that question because we just started looking and cataloging what kind of greenery they're, okay. they're putting. So um, we're looking at continuing this, and we might be able to get at that question with that. But that, yeah. So, like, it, in theory, like, they should be, these things should be co-evolving, right? So they should be becoming somewhat resistant to them as well. Um, but in regards to that, yeah, the eagles should be changing their selection based on, on that response. So, yeah. So I'm going to finish with something that you can all look forward to. When Britt finishes all these, we're going to have a race, right? We're going to have bets. And she's going to raise her chicken bugs versus the bed bugs. Um, so if you'd like to bet on that, you can raise a fundraiser um, for the end of the year party. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. And if you want to um, discuss this more, where would you like to go, Brit? I want to go to Bar Granica. Bar Granica it is. Please join us there if you'd like to talk more about bugs. And um, thanks, Brit. Yes. Do you get to keep the little bugs coated in gold? Because that'd be sweet. Yeah. You do? What are you doing with it?